So the exaltation of the cross uh, falls this week. And so the Sunday before and the Sunday after are dedicated to this theme of the cross. Uh, and so the gospel reading for today, the Sunday before the cross, comes from Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, this famous conversation where uh, Nicodemus, one of the rulers of the Jews, comes to Jesus at night because he's afraid. Right? He's afraid of what other people might think. He's afraid of how it will affect his reputation. He's afraid. Now, Nicodemus pops up two other times in the Gospel. He pops up uh, all three times in John. So the first time here when he comes to Jesus at night. And then the second time uh, about chapter 7 or 8 when the, uh, the rulers of the Jews want to condemn Jesus, and Nicodemus says, you know, does our law condemn a, condemn a man without listening to him? And they say to him, are you also from Nazareth? Look and see that no prophet arises from Nazareth, right? So at least he tried to stand up at least once. And then we find him again with Nicodemus, bringing a hundred pounds of myrrh mixed with spices to anoint his body. So even though he's a bit of a coward, right? All the cowards, you know, we, we still have hope. Um, even though he's a bit of a coward, he still followed Jesus. He loved Jesus. But when he came to Jesus, Jesus really perplexed him. Right? Remember the famous line, you must be born again or born from above. Right? There's no way that you can know God or, or receive the kingdom of God or understand the kingdom of God without a personal engagement. It doesn't happen automatically. Right? It's not like becoming a Canadian. Right? You're born in Canada, you're a Canadian. Right? You might be a bad Canadian, you might be a terrible Canadian, right? but you're Canadian. But to be born into the kingdom of God, it's a matter of both faith and baptism. Right? Those who, we read it in Galatians, right? Those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Right? Those who don't believe will be condemned. So, our salvation is both something that happens to us, but also something we engage in. It takes both, right? You can't be born again just by wanting to be born again, right? Any more than you can make the sun rise just because you want the sun to rise. But what you can do, as some famous monk once said, is you can be awake when the sun rises, right? That if you want to engage, you want to personally engaged in your relationship with God, you want to have this experience of the life of God in you, you have to hunger for it. You have to ask for it. You have to thirst for it. And God, in his time, in his way, will come to you. But he might come to you the way he came to Nicodemus in a very confusing way. Not at all what he expected. Nicodemus comes to Jesus thinking he's going to be the Messiah, thinking he's going to overthrow Israel, having already in his mind an agenda, an idea of what it's supposed to be like. How many of us have done that, right? We've all done that. I, I have this plan in my mind, this idea of what my religious life is supposed to be like. And then when it doesn't happen, when it doesn't work out that way, 
Like, I think, well, maybe there's no God, right? Thinking, well, I mean, isn't that arrogant of us, right? God doesn't do it the way we think he should, so we think maybe he doesn't exist. I can't tell you how many times, how many times, I've met, let's just say, quasi-atheists, right? These are people who are atheists mostly because, not because they don't believe in God, but because they're mad at God, right? Well, you know, this happened in my life, and where was God? Well, he was standing right there watching what you were doing. He was right next to you. He was closer than your breath. He was inside you. Well, why didn't he... I don't know, ask him. He knows, but just because you don't know doesn't mean he made a mistake. Just because God doesn't work on your schedule, your agenda. What? I mean, remember? He's God, inconceivable, invisible, inscrutable, uh, you know, eternally the same, etc., etc. All these ins we do in English. In this, in this, in this, on that, on that, not this, right? Because we can't even say what he is, we can only barely say what he's not, right? I love inscrutable, right? Inscrutable. I hardly even know what that word means, right? And, and he's that. Right? He's inscrutable. Right? It means you can't screw him. <laughs> Actually, I know what it means. It, it means. it means you can't imagine or figure out. You can't, right? you can't imagine or figure out. And so this is, and so Jesus, or Nicodemus comes to Jesus having something in his mind and Jesus just blows him away. Well, you have to be born again. Well, wait a minute. Okay, like what? Do I enter my mother's womb? And uh, No, 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 no. You know, it, it's not... He doesn't get it, which is fine. We don't, none of us really get it. I, I love the... Uh, some forms of Western Christianity argue that you have to be a certain age before you can officially be a believer because you have to understand what you're doing. I don't understand what I'm doing. Like, I'm completely, and again and again, surprised. Right? I just take the little bit I know, the little bit I think I know, and I, I take one, I, I step on that, right? There's this uh, famous uh, saying, uh, someone who was again arguing why he's an atheist, and his uh, argument was um, because of all the things that I don't understand. This is the, it's, there's just so much in the Bible that is in, inscrutable, that is just unexplainable. You just can't understand it. It's apparently contradictory. Who knows, maybe it is contradictory. Maybe God threw a couple contradictions in there just to stir us up, you know? I mean, who knows, right? How many angels were at the tomb? One guy says two, one say, guy says one. And uh, uh, My favorite one is, what did it say on the cross of Christ? All four gospel writers say it differently. It's like, well, wait a minute. How could there, was there, maybe there was four things on the cross of Christ. I don't know. It's inscrutable. It's inscrutable. And he said, uh, oh, that's what it was. It was Mark Twain. Someone said to Mark Twain, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's so much in the Bible that I don't understand. It, it's just ridiculous. Uh, and it frightens me. And Mark Twain respond, responded, oh, it's not what I don't understand in the Bible that frightens me. It's what I do understand. <laughs> right? It's what you do understand that you'll be held accountable for. Right? And so Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, right, which I was going to talk about, but I don't want to keep you here for another 20 minutes. Um, but go back, read uh, Numbers chapter 21, 
basically everybody's griping and complaining and as a, as a consequence of their complaining, these fiery snakes, fiery serpents, um, appear and start biting them. And several people die. And God, Moses, then intercedes for the people. I got an email from someone this week saying, uh, there's nowhere in the scripture where God commands or allows one person to intercede for another. It was like, okay, honey, we need to just, um, let me hold your hand. We need to take a, a little walk through the Bible. <laughs> and uh, so I tried to be real gentle, but uh, I don't know. She didn't respond. Um, and he intercedes for the people, and God tells him to do the strangest thing, right? He had just given them the Ten Commandments and told them not to make any graven images. And what does he tell them to do? I want you to make a graven image of a snake of all things and put it up on a pole. And whoever looks to it who has been bitten will be healed. Is that the craziest thing you ever heard of? It's in the Bible. Go read it. Leviticus 21. I just read it again this morning to make sure it didn't disappear since the last time I read it. It's there. And, and I would be tempted to ignore it, except Jesus himself quotes it and says that's what he is. He is like that serpent being lifted in the wilderness. But the serpent is a symbol of evil. Ah, didn't St. Paul said, he who knew no sin became sin for us? that we might become the righteousness in Christ. So he became sin. He took all of our sin and became like the image of the snake. Weird. And suffered. And of course, Nicodemus didn't get it. But he still loved him. And I often don't get it. But I do my best to still love him. And even if none of us get it, it's okay. We can still love him. And, and he will accept it. And he will have mercy on us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.